you have your Bible, will you be so kind to turn with me to the book of Ephesians? The book of Ephesians. Last week, as we started, we looked at those first two verses of Scripture. and We found that in those two verses of Scripture were some really important information. Uh, we learned that uh, Paul says, hey, listen, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ, which simply means this. He was set apart and chosen by God with a specific message for a specific group of people. Then he says he was an apostle by the will of God. This wasn't something that he just took on himself that he assumed. This was something that was placed upon him and something that God called him to do. He refers to the fact that as he goes with this message, he's speaking to the saints, right, of, in Ephesus in that area, uh, who are faithful in Christ. Now, let me ask you a question. It's easy to become a saint, right? All you have to do is believe, but it's hard to be a faithful saint. That means you've got to live it out. He goes on and talks about the fact that as uh, saints who are faithful in Christ, God has bestowed upon us his grace and his peace. And those, that grace and that peace come from two sources, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what I want you to remember is this. Saints aren't sinless, right? Saints aren't sinless, but their lives should reflect who it is they have placed their faith in. So all throughout Ephesians, I want you to keep this one thought in mind. What you believe is true determines how you live out your daily life. What I mean by that is how you believe shapes how you behave. Does that make sense? How you believe shapes how you behave. Now, can I ask you to do me a favor? How many of y'all can remember what it was like to be a little kid? Especially a little kid on Christmas morning. And you woke up and you were so excited and you went downstairs and you, and you saw all the things that you knew were for you. And all of a sudden someone says, well, what do you think? <laughs> you could hardly get what? Anything out. These verses of Scripture that we're getting ready to read, verses 3 through 14, many have said are a long, continuous sentence in the Greek. In other words, as Paul began to think about these spiritual blessings, it was like he had a continual sin. He could never catch his breath. Have you ever seen a person that excited, that they're just so overwhelmed with what I want to tell you, that you're just saying, hey, listen, take a breath, take a breath, take a breath. <laughs> That's how excited Paul was when he became um, talking about these spiritual blessings. In fact, as we read this, what you're going to find is this. This phrase, in Christ, in Him, is going to be contained, are you ready? 11 times in these few verses of Scripture. So if you found your place in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, would you be so kind to stand with me as we read God's Word together? The Bible says, Bless be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has placed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters by Christ Jesus to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in, all, in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession 
to the praise of His glory. Join me as we pray together. Father, as we just read that text together, we can begin to see the crescendo of Paul's excitement. Help us, O oh Lord, see how that applies to us as believers today, as saints even today. And we'll be grateful if we ask these things in your name. Amen and amen. And you may be seated. What I want to do this morning really simply is lay out for you what the Bible says are our spiritual blessings when we find ourselves in Christ. Once we've given our life to Christ, Christ gives us spiritual blessings. The first one is this. He chose us. He chose us. Look back at verse 4. In verse 4, what does it say? Just as he chose us in him. Notice before the foundation of the world. Now, can I ask you a question? When you were younger and you were getting ready to play in various neighborhood sports, what did they tend to do? They put you along the wall and they said, okay, we're going to have Johnny and we're going to have Tim be the captains. All right, y'all choose your teams. Anybody get choose, chosen last? Any, anybody wonder if you're going to get chosen? <laughs> I want you to know something. The Bible tells us that God chose you. God chose you. Paul wants the people in Ephesus who are continually wrestling against all the evil influences of the culture to know that God chose them in Christ to be holy and blameless. Paul wants them to know he loves us. He loves us. Now, Here's the whole thing I want you to grasp. Paul says all that knowing full well the condition of our heart. <laughs> Amen? He, he knows that the Bible tells us we were dead in our sins. But God demonstrated. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still what? Sinners. Enemies. At odds with him. Now here's what I want you to grasp. We did nothing to deserve what it is God has done for us. We did nothing to deserve what it is God has done for us. As I stated, all of this was done even before the foundation of the world. We were chosen, selected. Secondly, we were adopted. We were adopted. I love what verse 5 tells us. Look at verse 5. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, I just want to just be real confessional. Sometimes when you see that word predestination, we can chase all kinds of rabbit trails. And when we begin to chase those rabbit trails, we miss out on what it is Paul wants us to understand. Paul wants us to understand as we've been chosen, we have been adopted we've been adopted as sons and daughters of the king now think about it with me for just a moment if you've been adopted into a family that means you've been granted full status as though you were naturally born into that family and you're given all the benefits of being a part of that family isn't that what john 1 12 tells us Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become what? Children of God. Children of God. We are treated as though we had already been born into the family that adopted us. I love what 1 John 3, 1 tells us. 1 John 3, 1 tells us about the incredible love of God this way. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Can, can I just tell you something? When we come to the place that we recognize what Christ has done for us and we receive and accept that for ourselves, we are no longer at odds with God. <laughs> We're no longer at odds with Him. There is now what? Peace because He gives us His peace. All because we were understanding that we have been chosen, we have been adopted as His sons and daughters. Thirdly, are you ready? We've been accepted. We have been accepted. Look at verse 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the beloved. Accepted in the beloved. Now that's what the New King James tells us. In more modern translations it says this. He lavished on us in the beloved. He has poured out on us 
who belong to his dear son. Can I just tell you something that I've learned as I watch people in this day and time? They need to feel accepted. Can I just tell you something? As people walk through that door and come into this church trying to find a home, you might think that you are friendly, but what they're really looking for is, are you willing to accept me, warts and all? Are you willing to accept me, the baggage that I bring and the person that I know God wants to help me become? Are you willing to accept me? You see, when a person feels accepted, then we need to understand they are therefore empowered to begin to be the person that God desires for them to be. Think about it. How many times has your son or daughter brought their report card home? And what do they tell you? The first thing when you open it up, hey, are you proud of me? Or maybe they were playing a game, or maybe they were doing something, and they come back and they look to you for approval, right? What are they wanting? They're wanting acceptance. And what I want to continue to encourage you is that God doesn't base his acceptance for us on how we what? Perform. The Bible tells us he already lavished his love upon us even before the beginning of the world. The blood of Christ has taken away the guilt of our sin. And I'm just going to tell you something. We stand before him perfectly and totally accepted. We're redeemed. We're redeemed. Look at verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. We have what? Redemption. Now, redemption implies that you have been purchased. In other words, someone has paid the ransom on something that you owed. The price for our sin, the payment to buy us out of eternal condemnation was fully paid. By whom? Christ Jesus. When he shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. Our redemption is spoken of as an event that has already taken place. In fact, over in Colossians, look what Paul says. He says this, He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. In Him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Listen, we are no longer slaves to the way in which we used to live. God desires to liberate us and redeem us because we have been bought with a price. Bought with a price. And then the flip side of redemption is we experience His forgiveness. His forgiveness, as the verse goes on and says, we have been redeemed through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of His grace. We no longer have to carry the burden of guilt for violating God's holy laws. We no longer have to do that. Can I I just tell you something I see in people all the time? I, I see people who are still carrying the burden of their guilt as though it wasn't forgiven at Calvary. Does that chain not get heavy? Oh, my dear friends, if you could ever understand, God doesn't want you to live under condemnation. God desires for you to live in the liberty of his love and grace. Listen to Psalm 130. The Bible tells us, Lord, if you kept a record of our sin, who, O Lord, could ever survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. The Bible tells us he has cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. Now you think about that. Where do the east and the west ever meet? They don't. (laughs) Do they? Man, we're chosen. We've been adopted. We've been accepted. We've been redeemed. We've been forgiven. And these verses in 8 and 10 talk about the mystery of his will. Look what the Bible says. The Bible says, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in all, (coughs) in one, all things, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in heaven. Him. My dear friends, I want you to understand something. God has given us all the wisdom and insight through his word and himself 
to help us understand what it is God desires to do in and through us. And more than that, so that we might bring him glory and honor. I love what the book of Revelation tells us in Revelation 4.11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power since you created all things. And because of your will, they have existed and were created. I'm going to just tell you something. When we begin to align ourselves to Christ in faith, we become a part of his perfect plan and purpose. God desires for others to begin to know more about him by the way in which we what? Live our daily lives. And then the Bible tells us something really powerful in verse 11. In him also we have obtained what? An inheritance. An inheritance. Now, can I just give you a little thought? What's included in this inheritance? What is it that God desires to give to us? Not only now, but in the future. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, these powerful words. As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them who love him. Can I just tell you something? If anybody tries to describe to you really the fullness of heaven, even though the word tells us somewhat of what heaven's going to be, that pales in comparison to what our actual experience is going to be. Because Paul tells us the eye and the ear can't even begin to what? Comprehend it. It is so remarkable what it is God desires to pour out upon us. The riches of his glory, the presence of himself, our eternal home. These things don't even scratch the surface of all the blessings that God desires to give us as a part of our inheritance. And then the Bible tells us something even just remarkable. It tells us we have been sealed. Sealed. Look at verse 13. In him you have trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now what you need to understand is this. That idea of sealed has a lot to do with what they call earnest money. If you've purchased a house, you had to put earnest money down. What's the earnest money mean? That means at closing, I'm bringing the rest of it. <laughs> earnest money, believe, says that I have intentions to purchase this home. And once everything has been done, I'm coming back with the rest of it. Now, what I want you to grasp in all being is simply this. That as God has chosen us and adopted us and sealed us, you need to understand, God desires for us to live in such a way that we experience the abundance that he has promised to us as his children. In that day and time, when a person was sending a letter one to another, they would take their ring and they would dip it in wax. They would seal the envelope that way so that when you received it, you would know no one has had a chance to read it. And you're opening it afresh and anew for the very first time. This is what Paul says in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Bible says the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are what? God's children. God's children. We are sealed. Sealed. You need to take great comfort in that. Because I'm here to tell you the enemy will try to get you to believe. No, no, no. no. Uh, that's, that's not possible. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> The Bible tells us that uh, when we place our faith in him, no one can pluck us out of the hand of whom? The Father. No one. And I love this thought. We are secure. We are secure. Look what the verse 14 tells us. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory? Let me kind of just help unpack some of that. As the Holy Spirit is our earnest, saying that we're coming back to take care of the rest of it, you and I need to understand, as Romans 8, 17 tells us, if we are His children, we also are God's heirs. And if we share in Christ's suffering in order to share in His glory, we are heirs together with Him. Write this verse of Scripture down. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. The Bible says, Praise 
the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God has given us new birth because he has great mercy. We have been born into a new life that has a confidence which is alive because Christ Jesus has come back to life. We have been born into a new life which has an inheritance that can't be destroyed or corrupted and can't fade away. And that inheritance is kept in heaven for us. So since you are guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed at the end of time. Hold on to those words. It can't be what? Destroyed. It can't be corrupted. And it can't fade away. I, I was talking to somebody just the other day. And they were telling me about some of the aches and pains that they were experiencing. And this is what they said. You know what? It comes with what? Age. Can I just tell you something? There are physical aches and pains we may experience on this side of glory. But the Bible tells us that God has kept for us in heaven something that doesn't have to worry about aches and pains. Because it's not going to be what? Corrupted or destroyed. It's going to be held on to for all eternity. Now I know I've gone through all that real quickly. But the reason why I want you to understand all that is so God's going to bestow all this upon us. Why? <laughs> why look at the Bible says the very end of verse 14 what does it say to the praise of his glory you may or may not have watched the tennis match yesterday in New York a young lady and another uh, professional tennis player battling it out going into three sets and all of a sudden, Coco Golf pulls it out. In utter awe, she falls onto the court. And then she kneels. Me trying to simply say she was taking it in. But those who understand her past know that what she was doing was what the Bible talks about. She was giving God all the praise and glory for giving her the victory. She was bowing her head in prayer honoring and acknowledging where the strength of that victory had come from. She was down one set <laughs> to a champion. And in many ways, it looked hopeless. But God gave her the stamina to pull it out. Listen, my dear friends, as God bestows upon us all of these spiritual blessings, we don't necessarily go to those blessings and thank them. We thank the one who gave us the blessing. We thank the one who is the source of the blessing. And we thank him for all that he has done now and forevermore. God simply desires for us to lift our voice to him in praise. That's why, without trying to be mean or arrogant, I simply say to you, when we come into this house on Sunday morning, none of us should just cross our arms as though, okay, God, you better do something today. Because <laughs> listen, he's already done it. We ought to come into this house, be so excited that we have the opportunity to engage him and encounter him that we can't wait to lift our voice to him in praise. Well, I just don't like to sing. Well, the Bible says God will place a new song in your heart. <laughs> that when he places it there, you can't contain it within your body. It will just come forth. God desires for us to give him praise and glory. Can I just tell you something? Have you ever thought about the fact that maybe your sourness and your attitude is what's keeping people from really following after Christ? Because let's just be honest. We are the ones who are the what? Outward witness. We are the display window. And if we're grumpy and act as though we've been sucking on lemons, how in the world is that supposed to attract a person who has no faith and bearing of who Christ is. Someone was asking me yesterday when I was at Bojangles, Preacher, every time I see you, you're smiling. Why are you smiling? What have you been up to? <laughs> and I said, I haven't been up to anything. But here's what I want you to know. The person who lives in me has given me so much to be thankful for. I can't help but be grateful for all that he has bestowed upon me. I'm just telling you. When you begin to walk around genuinely, not like a little phony plastic spy, but when you begin to 
smile out of what is in your heart, God is going to begin to help you have an opportunity to bear witness of who he is because somebody's going to notice and ask of you, like they asked of me yesterday, why is it in all the things that happen in your life, you always seem to know who you can rely upon? It reminds me of a story uh, that I want to share with you. It's a story about a guy by the name of Carl. You know a lot of Carls. He's quite wealthy and somewhat arrogant. He was the largest landowner of the area. <laughs> he was going along his farm and just counting all the many things he had acquired and saying to himself, there's nobody in this area that has more than me. He happened to come across one of the poor tenant farmers who helped him on his farm. His name was Hans. He said, Hans, what are you doing? Because he noticed he was bowing his head. He says, well, sir, uh, to be honest with you, I'm thanking the Lord for this meal. This is what Carl said. If that's all I had to thank God for, I sure would thank him. Hans said, well, sir, I, I just want you to know the Bible tells us we ought to thank God in all circumstances, and I'm thanking him that he's given me something in which to eat today. They have a brief conversation. And all of a sudden, before Carl leaves, Hans says, Sir, I've got something I need to tell you. It reminds me so much of the message that we heard in Sunday school this morning. Carl reaches around and says, What do you want to tell me? He says, Sir, well, here's what I want you to know. I, I had this dream last night. And in the dream, I was told that the richest man in the valley is going, to die, is going to die tonight. The richest man in the valley is going to die tonight. What do you think that means? Well, sir, I, I don't know. That's just the dream I was given. So here's the crazy thing. Carl gets home and begins to think about that dream, and he begins to realize there is nobody in the valley more richer than I. <laughs> so I guess that means I'm going to die tonight. So I'm going to outwit God. I'm going to call my doctor. I'm going to have my doctor come and hang out with me and keep a constant monitor of me. Because if he can watch my symptoms and watch my physical appearance, maybe if anything God wants to do, he can thwart it. The doctor came over. Played cards with him, played games with him, talked with him. Early in the morning, Carl says, I knew it wasn't going to happen. I hate to waste your time, Doc. The doctor said, sir, that's been fine. I, I appreciate that. I'll give you my bill uh, sometime toward the first of the week. I hope that you have a good day. The doctor leaves. In a few hours, there comes a knock at Carl's door. It's a messenger. And the messenger comes by and simply says this. He says, sir, I thought you needed to know that one of your tenant farmers passed away last evening. Who? It was Hans. He went home to be with the Lord last evening. You, you see, Carl might be physically the most wealthy person of the valley. But Hans was the one who was the most spiritually wealthy. And that dream was an encouragement that that evening, God was going to call Hans home. I love the little story of a little boy. <laughs> I think of myself when I was much younger. My grandparents, when I would go to Cary and stay there sometimes for the summer, would take me to Piggly Wiggly. My granddaddy would say, Skeeter, pick out anything you want. Well, of course, as kids, what do you have your eye on? The candy aisle. Now, there was this jar that sat at this one cash register that the, the, er, the area of it was just big enough for you to put your hand in. And what was amazing is I learned that if I didn't put my hand in here, guess what the cashier did? The cashier said, son, don't you want some of this candy? I said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, get you some. No, no, no. Let me just reach in there and get it for you. You know what I learned? If I waited on that cashier or my granddaddy to get me the candy, I sure got a lot more. You know why? Their hands were a lot bigger than my little hands. See, I, I realized that when I put my little hand in there, I just got a few little pieces of candy. But when they put their hand in the candy jar, woo! I got so much I could fill two pockets up. Can I just tell you, that's the way it is with the Lord. You see, I want to remind you, how do we access 
access all these blessings. Go back to verse 3. If you have your Bible still open, look what it says. Blessed. By the way, that word means like eulogy, speaking good words. Be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Look what it says. Who has blessed us. It doesn't say who will bless us. It says who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You, you see, when we place our faith in Christ, as the old adage is, he does the rest. And he gives unto us that which he determined way before even the beginning of time would be ours as his children. The decision is, are we one of the saints? Join as we pray. Father, <laughs> too often as believers, we live like paupers. We fail to realize all that you have done on our behalf. All the many things that you have lavished upon us because you care for us. Well, I'm not sure which one of these blessings may have spoken to someone this morning, but I just pray that during this time of invitation, as you lead us, that maybe, just maybe, what we need to do is come to this old-fashioned altar or sit on that first row and take a moment to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for adopting us, for accepting us. Thank you for redeeming us, for forgiving us. Thank you for sealing us. Thank you for the inheritance that awaits us. Oh, Father, help us quit looking just at your hands. and Help us begin to gaze into your face. Into the loving eyes of our Heavenly Father. In these moments, my simple prayer is that you'll allow the Lord to do only that which he can. And that he'll find you responsive to his leadership. These things we ask in your precious and holy name.